you guys what it really means to me. The courtesy laughs and pretend guffaws that you do, it really makes me feel like I have a, a humor, which I appreciate. Because that's most likely not really true, but you guys make me feel like it is. Today, I wanted to talk about um, ideas for projects and uh, the final capstone project. I wanted to talk about uh, a lot of people turned in stuff the last couple of days and I'm still getting caught up grading that. My goal by the end of the weekend is to have everything caught up again. And then, you know, it's just like eating. Every time you get done, you feel like you got to start over again or changing diapers or fill in the blank. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, and answer you guys' questions regarding how to increase points and things like that. Uh, there's an issue, an ongoing issue, and I don't know what the issue is uh, regarding, um, I ask you to put like a comment in at the discussion for a specific assignment. You put it in and then I never get notified from the system. And so I, I, I want to talk about that a little bit too. And some of you guys who've taken classes with me before appreciate the ongoing uh, user interface error that I have. And then we'll, we'll and I'll try to cover that pretty quick and then we'll go on with uh, today's module. This, I, every once in a while I like to do a module where we kind of see people living on the planet at the same time around the globe that interact with each other. You know, what's going on at the same time? Like in the 2720 class, we talk about how uh, the Renaissance in Europe interacted with the Renaissance in India. And uh, we, we talk a little bit about, about that and some interesting stuff. And so, uh, and that is what we're talking about today, where um, the middle age period between the eighth century and like the first part of the Crusades, um, eighth, ninth century, right around there. Anyways, so going back to what I had wanted to um, touch on, first, do you guys have any questions about stuff that is going on so far? Okay, good. And the email, I have, uh, the email is supposed to trigger to my campus email account. And I go in and check it um, every day or every two days, uh, the uh, Canvas email account. I'm not really concerned about that because it's supposed to send your emails for onto my uh, Utah Tech account. And every once in a while, like today, I was going through, and I know I checked the emails um, two days ago, but an email showed up from the 18th, and another email showed up on the from the 20th that I had never seen. And so, if you guys, if there is a pressing issue, please, um, and if I'm not responding within 24 hours of your email, text me with your name and which class you're in and say, hey, I sent you an email through Canvas or I sent you an email on the university account and I, I um, yeah, this is something that I really need to talk to you about. And my text number is 801-367-4893. And that's also on the syllabus. So if you are planning a trip to go to Canada and you want to do something that you think might make a good project and you need to know before you go, and it, for whatever reason the email is not getting to me, text me and I will respond um, as soon as I possibly can. Um, one of the 
the issues that comes up every once in a while is people have a hard time coming up with ideas for discovery and research projects. Do you remember the, I think it's the third module for the class is titled uh, discovery and research projects or research and discovery projects. And about three or four thing, lines down, you will see, let's see if we can find that. Okay, it is the third module. If you go to your modules uh, page in Canvas, third module is labeled research and discovery projects. Third line item down says project ideas submitted by class. Underneath it is the date August 21. That has a lot of ideas to go through. And I don't expect, I do not want you guys to go there expecting to come up, uh, just follow one of those ideas. Don't even worry about that. But go through that and use that as a uh, brainstorming exercise to see if that triggers other ideas. And then um, you can always contact me. And if I, again, if I'm not responding to email right away, text me. And uh, there are some things that you need to do. Um, in, in this class, in these classes that I've taught, people have come up with really brilliant ideas. But part of making it a, a project that ties into this class is first, it must be a subject that is covered in, within the scope of this class. That means it must be solidly based on art that is produced before the year 1350. So um, for example, if you come up with the idea for your discovery project, I'd like to try making some pizza because we, we've talked about Rome and that sounds like a good idea. To make that into a project, a discovery project that would be viable for this course, what you need to do is start researching Roman mosaics and um, uh, paintings, other artwork, and you will find uh, murals and mosaics that have food items in them. Then you could uh, have a couple pictures of that and, and say something like, this inspired me to see if I could reproduce any of the food that it looks like the Romans were looking at in their artwork that solidly fits within the scope of this class. Then you would, you could find like a YouTube uh, video about ancient recipes, for example. And uh, say, so, you know, why, how we know what the ancient recipes were. And then you could also um, do some research on the different kinds of breads that you thought you saw in the murals and the mosaics. And if you couldn't find anything that looks even remotely like pizza, you could say, hey, I saw in this uh, fresco in Pompeii and this mosaic in Herculaneum, what looks like a flat bread. And that reminded me of pizza. So I wanna see if I can make some Roman flat bread. And then that totally ties it into the class. Then what you would do is the best possible thing to do would be to make a time lapse of you creating the thing and uh, or a video of some highlights of you making it. And then when you do your presentation, you would do a voiceover describing how you did all the, the research and everything leading up to this. You did, you'd show your three recipes of simple Roman flatbread and uh, give your citations you know, where, where the recipes come from. Now, um, Caleb, I'm going to, I'm going to use him. He's on, um, I'm, I'm going to see if I can block his microphone so he can't respond at all. But last year he found uh, a tea pie, but he found a pie, <laughs> Caleb. He found a pie in, I believe it was a Baroque era painting. And he started looking into it and discovered that during the Baroque times, that was towards the tail end of the age of discovery, that's when people were being, bringing tea from China and India back to Europe and trying to find all sorts of uses for them. That's where we get the, um, the high tea, the, you know, the tea time and all that kind of cultural stuff. And he discovered that there was actually recipes online that were reconstructions of what people thought the tea pie may have been. 
because there were instances of people first time in the, you know, in the 16th century encountering tea, not knowing what to do with it, thinking it was supposed to be a pie filling. And I think his example tasted awful, but there was somebody else in the class that thought, yeah, that sounds fun. And so without referencing any of the material that Caleb found, they also did uh, a tea pie discovery project. And in their case, because it was post Caleb, uh, they knew to make sure there was plenty of sugar added. And they said that it was actually tasted pretty good. No, mine was the great tasting one. Yours was, okay, it was the other way around. The other yeah. guy. Homeboy okay. failed, not I. All right, good. And um, so it was, sugar makes everything better. I, I just put that out there. Egyptians knew this. They used honey to treat all sorts of wounds because uh, honey is bacteria, bacteria static and will actually help your wounds heal faster. And so by derivation, that means, of course, that sugar has to be good for you. And regardless of what my wife, who's a nutritionist, says, sugar has to be good for you. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm glad. But th that, that was really interesting. Caleb was able to tie it soundly in to the, the scope of the class, which, which was uh, really excellent work. Another question that people have had is, what do I do about the final project? The final project is supposed to be about 10 hours. And I would tell you, the easiest thing to do would be to do a discovery project where you are focusing on learning what you can about something and its depiction in art. And then that you know do that for about three to five hours. And then the rest of your time, do a discovery project linked to that where you've already done the research and just replicate whatever it is you researched about and you know put the extra time into that. And for the, the final project, a time lapse of the work that you do. I really appreciate all of you that have done time lapse of your discovery projects. That is excellent. A couple of people have made uh, cut together videos of them doing stuff. And that is, is really great too. And uh, several people have made videos with their PowerPoint uh, presentations where they walk through it. And that's all those work really well. So does anybody have any questions uh, regarding ideas of projects they can do? By the way, that pizza idea has already been taken. So um, if you want to do a version like with Greek pizza, because there is actually um, – one you can do with uh, Greek flatbread and do several recipes for that. That one is open. You can go ahead and do that. But is that anybody have any questions about uh, what they could possibly do or need help with ideas? If you do, talk to me after class or text me, and I am more than happy to go walk through that. Um, a couple people have had really creative ideas. When they initially presented them, it did not work. But after uh, just a bit of reflection and um, re writing about what, what they were doing and how it linked to class, it, it works perfectly. And I think that that's the key, being able to articulate how you find the connection between what you want to do and the scope of the class. Um, that's, I think, cognitively probably the biggest effort of the whole project but um, it actually makes it so that you can get graded. You, you can receive a grade for it. Um, any questions about any of that? Excellent. To improve grades, uh, a couple people today got their grades improved on projects simply because they went through and they sent in a documentation updating their um, citations. And that, that is what is almost always the problem when you don't get a full grade is the citations. Um, another person, their, um, their file was corrupted. So they sent in a, a clean file and that worked fine and they were able to, to get the grade. Another person sent in, uh, um, a file, they had to email it because Canvas wasn't taking it. But unfortunately, the email made it so I had to get permission. And I haven't been able to update the grade yet because they haven't responded with permission for me to open the file yet. 
Um, I would rather not ever, uh, you don't get graded in, until I see the file. And so it's a bad idea to submit a file that I have to get permission to do. Because most of the time I just will give it a zero and ask you to submit an actual file. The biggest problem with this is when you use a mobile device and try to submit a project file with your mobile device, it seems like that is when it asks for permissions the most. And it also will send in HEIC files, which I can't read. So those that's that's the easiest fix, just um, changing the file. And um, then second is just updating your citations. All right, if there's no, no more questions about that, I would like to go ahead and uh, move forward. Do you guys remember why this period is called the Dark Ages from the fifth century up until 1350? Do you remember where we got that term from? It is just mildly ethno-eurocentric. During the Enlightenment, everybody was trying to demonstrate to the universe that white European males were the peak of God's evolutionary plan for the entire universe. And um, as part of that, they said that since they decided that since the Renaissance uh, really glommed onto the uh, classical stylizations of the Greeks and the Romans, that everything between those two groups had to have been unenlightened. And thus we get the term Dark Ages. It's interesting to me because there are a couple of periods during the Dark Ages in Europe where literacy was actually double what it was during the Renaissance. One of those time periods was during uh, the Carolingian Renaissance. More people can read and write under the reign of Carol uh, Carolinus or Charlemagne um, than uh, during the uh, Italian city-states during the Renaissance. So I, I always thought that that was really funny. One, something else that I thought it was interesting about um, that time of Charlemagne is that this is when he put a lot of money, if you remember, he put a lot of money into monasteries that produced really beautiful books. And uh, it became fashionable. This, I think this is one of the time periods where handbags became fashionable because a woman of means would carry um, a psalmistry or um, a gospels book, just, just a couple chapters or um, a couple books from the New Testament with her that was beautifully detailed and these books would be um oh let's see if i can yeah these books would be about this big or smaller so about the size of a trade paperback absolutely gorgeously bound and seven out of ten times the woman carrying the book around could not read it because that wasn't her role her role was to demonstrate her family's wealth not to actually demonstrate her learning and that is not to say at all that women were stupid or ignorant. It was just that um, different kinds of learning fit better for different people's lives and the roles they had in society. But uh, during, more often than not, uh, during the reign of Charlemagne, if a woman carried a book with her, she probably did know how to read it. Because the, uh, the two most literate groups at that time were um, the priesthood which includes um, nuns and uh, uh, women of, of good families. Uh, they, they usually did know how to read. Other groups that knew how to read were uh, foremen and yeomen. Uh, they usually would also know how to read. This is where we also get the development of the word villain. Do you know what villain means? It actually means dependable salt of the earth. The person who was a villain was somebody that you could, that a landowner could call on at a second's notice and they would drop absolutely everything and be at the master's service immediately. They were considered less servants and more um, comrades at arms. And uh, just over the last 
800 years, that word has been morphed in, or 1,000 years, that word has been morphed to mean something very different now. <laughs> anyway, blah, 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 moving on. But at least you guys got a little bit of a nap in there. OK, I want to play this. And if it doesn't allow me to play it, uh, go when you're watching this recording, go ahead and go back and listen to it. I think that's enough of that. I I wanted to share that just because I wanted to give you a flavor that was a little bit palatable about what music was probably sounding like at about this time. This is particularly Europe, but if you were in areas like um, Turkey and North Africa, music would not be sounding too different. It would it would have different flavors and different things like that. It'd be different using different rhythms. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to take a break. I forgot to close the door. The dog is out harassing. She only barks at like four-year-old girls when they're walking by with their dolls. So hold on just a second. Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. She's been quiet for six hours, so I figured she'd be fine. Should have known better. Anyway. Listening to that music, even though it was a tune that we are can recognize today, um, there's some things that I want that I think that um, the artist who calls herself Hildegard von Blingen really does a good job bringing out. You have a simple, very clear uh, vocal line, and you notice that the the sound is a little bit off. It's not quite the scale that we're familiar with today. Mostly that's because um, uh, the, the C-sharp scale that is so popular in pop music today is actually derivative of the subconscious humming that we listen to uh, from the, um, the current going through the wires in our homes. And that's what our bodies are responding to. And so when we hear music from eras that didn't have that, it's going to sound just a little bit off or a little bit different than what we're familiar with. And you notice the, the instrumentation is relatively simple uh, with some in interesting things going on. Uh, at, the, at this time in, in um, at least the areas around the Mediterranean and North Africa and Europe, social media was conducted through music and entertainment. That's how people found out things. 
Uh, you get uh, the troubadours, you get, uh, there were not just traveling men that would uh, sing songs and give news. There were also traveling women that would have uh, retinues that, that would uh, do the same kind of thing. Uh, there were actually a whole, whole entire performance groups that would travel around. And as a good landowner, you supported your people by uh, throwing parties for them, including paying for entertainment. Uh, you know, people would entertain themselves as well, but that was just one of the things you do to demonstrate your resourcefulness and wealth as a good leader, as well as uh, sharing with your people that you care about them. And I wanted to look at, at some of the art um, here and just this, this stuff is about for the same uh, time periods. And what, what we're looking at right now is 800 to 1190, right around the, I mean, 1090, right around that area. Now, this is called the bio tapestry. And it's interesting because it's really not a tapestry. Uh, this is an embroidery. What's the difference? Anybody know the difference? Is an embroidery maybe something that would um, be adorned on uh, something less permanent, like clothing? Yeah, I, I, um, embroidery is a sewing technique that is usually reserved for uh, clothing items, that kind of a thing. What makes the, the bio tapestry different is that this is actually embroidered on uh, cloth that where the pieces of the cloth are sewn lengthwise or sewn end to end. So it's very long. This is kind of like a cloth version of the um, column of Trajan. And it tells the history of the founding of um, uh, England and Brittany, I believe. And you see, see all these different figures and everything. A tapestry is actually um, a design work that is done by weaving where the different elements of the design are woven into the fabric of the material. And embroidery is they start with a piece of fabric and then sew onto it. That's what the biggest difference is. But uh, I believe in that, okay, yeah, here we go. I wanted to share this with you. This is the bio tapestry and it, Talks, it has a lot of pictures and everything on it. It's really worth looking at. This was uh, believed to have been made. Um, well, it, it tells the conquest of England by William Duke of Normandy. So it came up to England from France, 1066. And it is, this thing is 210 feet long, essentially. And it just, and if you can imagine winding that around a column, it would be basically like Trajan's column. What is amazing to me is that this thing is a thousand years old and has been taken care of by so many families over the years that it is still in astonishingly good shape. And we look at this and we look at the, the imagery and we think, oh, these guys don't know how to do realistic stuff. Well, What's interesting to me about that is they're working with a material that is not does not blend, um, lend itself to high detailed artistic expression. I don't know if any of you guys have embroidery experience. I do uh, counter cross stitch. It is not something that you can actually blend colors easily in. And so, so you know, considering the technique and the material used. It, it's pretty amazing what they were able to do. And then the other thing is, when you look at this, whatever they've done with the detail, there is still enough there that you can recognize. This is actually an, an animal that uh, was um, is, is a fairly common feature of Egyptian bronze casting from about the, the 10th century. This is... A, a pretty consistent 
to historical depictions of a wyvern and a griffin from old uh, Germanic uh, work. And this looks very much like a Seljuk Turk helmet. So whatever they're doing, there, there's enough detail in it that you can identify the material exactly. You know exactly what type of ship this is and what the, the, um, this, the line of the horses are. So um, I, I just think that that's pretty cool. And another piece I wanted people to look at is, this is from about the same time. This is a set, uh, this is an ivory uh, tablet. Now this thing is about, keep in mind, this is maybe about nine inches long and four inches tall. Okay, so we're talking about serious, uh, miniature detail. Now, looking at this, knowing that this is done by a, a Christian group in, you know, for a Christian audience, what are some of the cues in here that you can see that might help you to understand what the story is? What's this? I'm, I think... I have a hunch it's, it might be Cain and Abel. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because right here we see this very beautiful uh, circle here. This is the uh, depiction of the mandorla, which is usually almond shaped, but it represents um, a portal into the heavenly realm. And by the, the halo, we can identify this as an angelic figure. It's actually not an angelic figure This is a, or a saintly figure. This is actually representing God. This figure here and right here and we have a good idea that that is substantiated because right here we have a similar mandorla with a hand coming out and both of these things being not normal you know for for an angel or a human being we identify that that is most likely god and then you have abel here with the lamb and cain here with the wheat and right here you have cain strangling Abel, and then God is reaching out to ask Cain to come to him, but because of his guilt, Cain is running away. And th there's some interesting things that I want to point out too. We, we could say, oh, they didn't know human anatomy. Well, they're working on a very tiny scale, and they're working in ivory, which is a very expensive material. So I, I think with those things in place, what they're what we're seeing is a, a fairly standard human face with a fairly standard common haircut and fairly standard clothes that were consistent with the time frame that this was being built shortly before the crusades their costuming is pretty consistent what is interesting to me is regardless of this artist's familiarity with the ideal human form they're able to demonstrate, just like you see in um, graphic novels, comics, different things like that, they're able to communicate the action very precisely to the point that Mark could tell exactly what the story is about. And you look at these leggings here. The separation between these incision marks is a little bit over a sixteenth of an inch. This is how detailed this is. So look at this detail right here. And what's interesting to me is that consistently we see the artists, regardless of how effective they are with developing a naturalistic human anatomy, we see that the eye lines are consistent. Cain is looking right at God's chin and God is looking directly at Cain's eyes. The most important aspect here of this figure is his hand and where he's looking, which I, I think is, is really amazing. And here we see that God's hand, he has the same kind of um, uh, mudra or hand gesture that Jesus uses when he blesses people. And his, the hand is going towards Abel, who's holding the sheep. And so I, this is 
what I see out of this is this is done by somebody who really did know exactly what they were doing. And I, I, I think it's a beautiful example of quote unquote dark age art. Anybody else have any observations about that? So the thing, the thing that caught, caught my attention to it being Cain and Abel is that on on the left panel, uh, one one of us, one of them, Cain is offering a, I don't know, a bushel of, of grain or something, while right. Abel is offering up a, offering up a, a sheep or. Yeah, lamb. That's right. Yeah, lamb. Yeah, and and hand like. Hand, hand of God is pointing towards towards Abel. Yeah. And the other thing I get is even though there's three Cains and two Abels, we can see that this is Cain killing Abel and then Cain right afterwards. You know, uh, look, wanting to escape God's judgment. Very descriptive. Now, um, as you go into this after we're done i don't I, because i blathered on just a bit about projects and all that kind of nonsense we don't have a lot of time but i do want you to watch the uh, myths about the middle ages very you know definitely watch that and uh look at this the met i have these are byzantine ivories where this is work and most of this work is from 9th 10th 11th century right around there from that the eastern roman empire you know and keep in mind how big these things are these are called pushes or a p y x i s they're um they're designed as uh, kind of um they're prestige item storage boxes and they're usually made out of ivory or silver is what what they're made out of and these things are only about the size of your fist a plaque like this is going to be the size of your notebook. And this, uh, the Virgin and Child statue, this may have been eight, nine, ten inches tall. So, you know, people are working on a miniature scale and doing ridiculous detail. I, I think it's absolutely astounding. But this video talks about. Um, a lot of the, the myths that we have today about the Middle Ages that in large part were um, compounded, if not outright invented by uh, the Enlightenment era scholars that were trying to um, share that history. There are some things that happened in the Middle Ages that I think are pretty gross. Right? And one of them is that there were orders of Christians who believe that water should only be used on the body for the ordinance of baptism, which meant that you would have somebody who died when she was in her 60s, who, and this is an actual saint, um, she was proud of the fact that her body had never uh, been touched by water except at the points where she blessed herself with holy water before praying. Okay, Brittany, I see that face. Yes, I agree completely. Uh, ick. <laughs> and then this, I think this is a, a really good, um, this is only supposed to be a minute long. Let's go ahead and watch this. And uh, if it doesn't, again, if it doesn't show up, uh, watch it after you uh, see our, the class.
I like that because it's short and it gives just a little bit of a bit um, of the timeline. And what we're going to be looking at, I want you guys to re keep in mind the four to tools of artistic critique. But these are the four things that this module will kind of touch on moving forward. Byzantine, remember everybody, where is the Byzantine art? Uh, where's the center of the Byzantine art? Which country, which present day country? Uh, Turkey. Yep, that's right. And they're the ones that kind of hold the torch of the Roman Empire, and they lasted um, quite a bit longer than the Roman Empire. The Muslim, that's from uh, 610 to present. What we're going to be looking at is stuff like um, uh, work specifically doing when, while these guys overlap, again, 8th to uh, 11th century. 10th century, right around there. Carolingian, we're going to look at a little bit of that, as well as Vikings. And what's interesting to me is, so we get the Byzantines, they interacted with Turkey and Eastern Italy, Eastern Europe, right around there. They were probably the most artistically recognized in most of Europe. And so a lot of their stuff influenced things like uh, how artists um, portrayed the human form. They drew a lot from that large eye, tall body kind of uh, model that the Byzantines had developed. Muslim, a lot of their decoration was stuff that, that craftsmen fell in love with. And so you see a lot of their floral decoration as well as geometry going through uh, Europe as well. Carolingian, this is where we get a lot of the really tiny detail work uh, the figures generally in Carolingian will look Byzantine with the large eyes and simplified bodies, but they will also have really big hands, which I, I, I think is really fascinating. Uh, you see in Carolingian architecture, you have the um, equilateral triangle defining the roof slope, uh, which represents Trinity, or, and then you also have uh, these buttressing towers at, at the entrance of a church, a Carolingian church that represent church and state. And you see that influence in architecture all throughout Europe and touching a little bit even into Turkey. Uh, Muslim stuff at this time was mostly going to, the heaviest influence is going to be all across Northern Africa from Egypt um, all the way to uh, I want to say Mor Morocco, all the way well, actually all the way to to Spain. Uh, at this time, Spain was uh, Muslim. Uh, uh, it was the Iberian Peninsula was uh, ruled by Muslims until about the twelfth, thirteenth uh, century. And then you get Vikings. The Vikings. They generated their own visual vocabulary, but you can kind of feel that it has some kinship with Byzantine figures, Islamic floral and uh, uh, geometric patterning, and then uh, some of the, the Carolingian uh, figures as well. And that influence, there's a lot of influence of um, Christianity from the Byzantines and the Carolingian in a lot of the Viking work from the 8th to 11th century. And the first cru crusade starts in 1096, and that's going to be about where we kind of draw the line on, th on this module. And there's a nice short video about what the crusades were, and we'll talk about them more as we go on. So this is a video that, that is a recap of uh, the Byzantine Empire. It's about five minutes long. Um, I don't really want to talk about it right now. We've already talked about that, but please watch that. Uh, this is uh, about the Islamic Golden Age. One of the things that I think is really fascinating is that different religions are you, well, I'm, I'm going to say this, how people use the religion to justify a particular world perspective is very different than the doctrines of that religion, almost all the time. And uh, 
it is interesting to me because um, there is no religion on the planet that has part of its uh, doctrine to be to remain as ignorant as humanly possible. Um, every faith invites the the individual, the participant, to engage in some sort of um, learning and reciprocal growth activity uh, under the vocabulary of that that faith. And um, it's interesting to me that in the West, Christianity has been used um, to justify uh, political rulership. And today, um, it has been incorrectly categorized as a, a system of ignorance by people who consider them themselves um, the intellectual elite, which, which is absolutely fascinating to me because uh, um, that, that simply is not the case according to the doctrines of, of, of faith, but that's how we view things. And uh, in the Islamic, you know, where with, with Christianity, we have this overarching view that um, that people should go by faith and not by reason. And in is Islamic tradition, uh, and this isn't, I'm not going to say Islamic tradition, it's going to be exterior tradition layered onto the Islamic world. There is uh, this perspective of something similar going on that is supposed to be propagated by uh, the doctrines of the faith. And that kind of information comes because people, because the individuals sharing those perspectives pick and choose what kinds of um, information they want to dole out. Uh, I've read a couple articles that said, uh, you know, you think, well, science is going to be counterintuitive to faith, but about two thirds of scientists today, leading edge of, in every field is, um, are uh, active participants in faith that can be li linked back to the four children of the book, which is uh, Judaism, Sabbateanism, uh, Christianity, and Islam, which, which I, I, I think is really interesting. Um, Christianity uh, is it, really fascinating to me because uh, Christianity seems to open itself up to a lot of uh, mystical Christianity and uh, traditional Islam seems to open itself up to a lot of scientific exploration, which, which is, is fascinating. And uh, th that's what this video kind of talks about, um, the science of uh, Islam. I believe it was the Caliph of Baghdad who for his entire reign was paying out the weight of books in gold to amass a huge library and he is the person who's con, um, considered to be responsible for uh, maintaining the integrity of the works of like Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, among other, other things. And it's material that was uh, kept safe in his library until the fall of Baghdad that actually were the uh, source documents for the materials that uh, most of the revolutionary uh, founding governments used to form their governments. You know, the, the ideas that the Enlightenment had about um, democracy and uh, the Republican ideal uh, came from the material in uh, Muslim libraries. I, I just think that that's really interesting. In the Carolingian Renaissance, we talked a little bit about that. Uh, please watch that. It, it's really fascinating. I, that is just something that was not on my radar at all, you know, growing up, because nobody ever talks about Carolingians, they, they fit firmly in to the realm of the Dark Ages. But these are the guys that developed the book arts to an astonishing degree. And the ideas that we have today regarding fonts and um, a graphic design for like magazine layouts and stuff like that all have their um, genesis in the Carolingian Renaissance, which I think is, is pretty cool. And then the Vikings, of course, that's, um, how many of you guys have a cell phone? 
How many of you guys have uh, earphones that are wirely, wirelessly attached to your cell phone so you can listen to music and stuff? Do you know where the Bluetooth technology gets its uh, name from? Harold Bluetooth. Harold Bluetooth, who was a super genius, a ruler of the Vikings in Northern Europe I, um, like a thousand years ago. Uh, all these guys were finding these big round rings that looked like they were carved, you know, that were hundreds of yards of, uh, across, carved into the dirt. They found out that Harold had been responsible for creating a network of forts and uh, highways, actual raised roadways, which the rest of Europe didn't see for another 400 years. Um, and he could get a message from one part of his kingdom, 2,500 miles to the other part of his kingdom in less than 28 hours. And because he was so good at connecting, making sure that everybody responsible for leadership could read and write in at least three languages, making sure that everybody responsible for communicating on a battlefield could read and write, and being able to, at that time in Europe, his was the most advanced communication technology available. When uh, wireless technology, communication technology first started developing, when the companies decided to honor him by calling it Bluetooth. And that the, you know, that X with the, the vertical line that you see as the symbol is actually his initials. So Ryan knew that, but I, I hope none of you did because then I'd feel dumb. And we, we talked about Byzantine art, and this is a little bit of re review for most of you. And I, I really want you to watch these videos again. I think they're amazing. And I absolutely love this. The Desus Mosaic in Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia is an actively used mosque. And mosques are not to have images of human forms in uh, the worship space. And this is one of two examples, well, one of a, very, a small handful of examples around the world where they actually do. And I think it's interesting. Who's this figure here? Christ. Yeah. I think it's interesting that one of the, the principal human figures in this active mosque is the resurrected Christ. I just, I just think that that's fascinating. There's uh, also videos that talk about those ivory boxes, like I showed you a couple examples. Incredibly fine, detailed work. The carving was just ridiculous. And a woman with a scroll. Um, now, this dates back to um, about a 1,000 years ago, a little bit over than that. What is so interesting about a Byzantine carving of a woman with a scroll what are the, some of the things that you extrapolate, can extrapolate from that? And there's, there's a really, really big one message that I think is really important. What's that, Brittany? My, well, I was just going to say, my first thought is that she's a woman. So the fact that they carved her, she must have been of pretty high importance or pretty high like status within society especially like based on her gowns and things as well. Yes, absolutely. I, I, it's, it's remarkable because it's rare to see um, a lot of women in, in surviving art from this time period, I think. Uh, what's something else that is really mind-blowing about this that we can extrapolate? The fact that she's holding a scroll. What is a scroll? A paper with a message? <laughs> yeah, it's it's a book. The, the fact that this is a woman that was important enough that she is immortalized in a sculpture is one thing. And then the fact that she's holding a scroll shows that it was important that she was be seen as being educated. And this is something that was, from the historical records, com, um, 
a lot more common than we assume it was because we assume that the only people that could read and write were monks. And so this is an educated woman. About this time period in um, Alexandria, there's a woman named um, Hypatia who was a uh, super genius. Uh, Carl Sagan called her the father of modern astronomy. And, uh, but um, sadly she died because a bunch of Christian, ignorant Christian zealots uh, skinned her alive with uh, abalone shells. But before that, she was absolutely astounding. And the more I look into this, the more I find that there are records of these polymath women that were super geniuses. Uh, you, um, an older city, uh, Petra, in, um, in Syria, uh, Petra had at one point, about a thousand years before this time period, uh, women were incredibly powerful as, as well. And this is a time when um, women could have uh, contract marriages where if she wanted to um, be with a man only until she had three children or only until she justified a percentage of his business or only as a business, uh, you know, partial ownership in the business or uh, because she didn't want to have a relationship with the guy. She just wanted children with him because she wanted a relationship with the guy's brother. I mean, women were in charge of uh, the social structure at the time. And this does show up, but a lot of this appears to have been washed away. We see people um, painting over signatures of um, Genelechi, for example, who is a brilliant Baroque uh, woman painter. Her students painted over her signature. Nobody even knew that she existed until um, X-ray technology could actually look through the paint. And uh, Brunelleschi Genelescu. But um, it's, it's fascinating to me When, when you do the digging and you do the finding, you realize that our perception of a lot of these periods is very different than what actually went, out, went on, what actually happened. And I think an immortal sculpture of a woman with a scroll goes a long way in um, validating a lot of that. And I, I really like this because uh, this person is doing a painting in the Byzantine style. And this is really worth watching. It's, uh, it's a modern, it's a contemporary painter, but he's been uh, trying to replicate the uh, paints that they use, the materials they use, as well as the brush strokes and um, just the brush effects and everything. This person demonstrates what an actual process of painting could have looked like. And then I really like this video about uh, Byzantine architecture. And I, I don't think we want to watch the whole thing, but um, we can see, we talked about there's that central dome. There's the cascading domes around it to support the weight. And then you have these smaller things and you have echoes of that a Roman or Etruscan roof line, as well as the Roman arches. And this talks about several of the different kinds of, of floor plans that were being used. This is a really good example of a Byzantine as opposed to a later Gothic floor plan. And the biggest difference, I don't know if you'll see, this is a church. The apse is facing to the east. What did the Gothic people, and this is not, we're not talking about this yet. I just want to see if anybody knows. What's the biggest difference between this and the typical Gothic uh, floor plan for a church? It looks a lot more co compact. Yeah, it's a lot more compact. Uh, the Gothics, they uh, resurrected uh, Vitruvius um, books on architecture, and he was the one who said that architecture needs to reflect the human form because that's who uses it. And so in a, in a Christian church from the Gothic period forward, uh, you would get this, but it would be adding wings right here. So it would represent the body of Christ, where Christ's head was here, his body and legs went towards the narthex, and then his arms would stretch out to the right and the left. So, which I think is kind of interesting, maybe even cool. <clears throat> I 
You know, with Muslims, we have we've talked a lot about Islamic art and geometry, and I think that this is a really good one. It's a five minute presentation on uh, is just history about Muslims and Islamic history. Um, and I'm going to ask a trick question, and I can almost be certain that you guys are going to answer it wrong. What are the branches, the main branches of Islam? Uh, Sunni is one of them. That's right. And believe it or not, there's two more. Does uh, anybody know what the three branches are? So we got Sunni. There's Shia. And uh, I think Ryan is, is pretty familiar with that. And then there's Ibadi. And right now... Um, most countries that uh, label themselves as Muslim are Sunni, uh, and uh, some of them um, are Shia, like uh, Persia, for example, is a Shia country. And there's only one country that I'm aware of that's a body, um, and that is Oman. Uh, just kind of an interesting thing. It will never be on a test, but I think it's fascinating. And I want you to look, watch, look at these videos about Islamic art. This shows a lot of that kind of patterning we were talking about, the kind of uh, vegetal abstracts that are placed on a geometric background. And then this is a Fatima script that I think is just absolutely astounding. It's called the Blue Quran because it's an entire book that is where the pages are dyed with indigo, which is one of the more expensive dyes. It's incredibly expensive. And the writing is all done with uh, essentially gold leaf. And it is absolutely amazing. And then this goes on a little bit more about the patterning. It talks about that. And then this, I think, is a really fascinating um, dive into the Dome of the Rock. And the Dome of the Rock is important because that is a structure that is placed over the rock that uh, uh, Jacob fell asleep on when he had his vision of heaven. Uh, when you, know, you get the, the phrase Jacob's ladder comes from that, when he saw the angels rising to heaven and, and descending on a ladder and he, he wrestled with an angel so he could uh, prove his uh, worth and his fortitude and um, basically, basically receive a guarantee of blessings for his offspring. And his offspring is very clear. It's... Um, uh, spiritual offspring, not just genetic. This is also the rock that um, some people believe Abraham um, was going to uh, sacrifice Isaac on, but instead sacrificed the, the ram that was caught in a thicket. And then uh, if you look at this rock, it looks, it appears that there's a, um, a hoof or a footprint in it. And um, at one time, the prophet Muhammad uh, he had been uh, thinking a lot about what heaven was really like, what the afterworld was was really like. And he had a vision called the Mirage, where he was transported to Jerusalem from his home. And uh, Baruch was an angel, an angelic being, who took him for a tour of uh, the celestial plane. And they launched from the earth at this rock. So it's, it's, it's a very important rock for... Um, basically all the children of the book. And um, the history of this building is that it was designed to shelter that rock for everybody to visit is, is what the intent of it was, which I, I think is really interesting. And then I, I really like this because this scholar is able to show how the influence of Islamic architecture really touched and transformed a lot of the late, later visions for building. Remember, we, we talked about after all these crusaders saw the Dome of the Rock, they came back to Europe and tried to figure out, we know it's possible now to build this astonishingly gigantic buildings. And they did it in a very different way. But that exposure to ancient architecture uh, really informed how they transformed how they saw uh, the use of engineering. And uh, uh, this scholar is able to demonstrate how that worked um, with exposure to Islamic architecture as well. 
Okay, and then we, we did talk about the Carolingians uh, as, as well. Talked about the Merovingian dynasties. Do you remember what that term Merovingian is kind of uh, alluding to? What word, word that we talked about, what name did we talk about that um, echoes the sound of that dynasty? The Merovingians are, are essentially called the Merovingians because they felt that a lot of that they were descended from Mary Magdalene, who a tradition held uh, was actually one of the wives of Christ, and um, she had her chi um, Christ child. And so, you know, it isn't just a movie thing. This is in a lot of historical traditions from that time period that after the death of Christ, Joseph of Arimathea uh, landed on the, the south coastline of France with a very pregnant Mary Magdalene. And uh, her children, her offspring, became the genesis of the Merovingian kings. At least that is the tradition that the Merovingian kings held on to. And that is why France still to this day has a fleur de lis or a lily in their flag because that lily is an emblem of Mary. Did you guys know all that? I think we talked about it a little bit. Oh, and I, I've got to make um, a comment. One, somebody said that I declared categorically that aliens are not responsible for the technology and apparent cross pollination of cultures. And I want to put make the record put the record straight. I am not going to say that categorically. There's a small part of me that really hopes that aliens had something to do with it. But sadly, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that we can point to uh, to validate that view. But I don't want you to feel that the door is completely shut, okay? Scientific inquiry holds that every question has potentially greater answers. So just keep that in mind. So all of these are really good videos. And uh, I, this is a really interesting one. Uh, Judaism at this time period, it, it's interesting to me because how religions get along is much more a reflection of uh, political posturing going on at the time than um, actual doctrines of the faith, which I, should not come as a surprise to anybody. And it's interesting when um, it's politically expedient for people to get along, to get along when it becomes uh, apparently politically a better move, you know, air quotes, for somebody to be ostracized or blamed than with the collusion of, of um, religious officials, elements of the religion are reinterpreted to uh, have that perspective. And which I, I, I think is just really, really sad. But, you know, you see this over and over again all the time. And uh, when, per, um, when the Muslim forces came into Jerusalem and took that over, I believe it was in the 8th century, uh, late 7th century, early 8th century, at that time, the um, Zoroastrians, were ruling. That was that was a religion of state, but the rulers, the Zoroastrian rulers, were not following the tenets of their own religion. They're being real buttheads. And uh, when the Muslims came in, at this time, everybody knew that for the last hundred years, the Muslims have been operating in a very different way than what the Zoroastrians had started doing when they took over Jerusalem. That is, the very first uh, couple generations of mosques, and one of the reasons why the tradition of uh, worship for Muslims is on Friday because these mosques were built for uh, Christians, Jews, and Muslims to all use. The Christians would use it on Sunday, the Jews would use it on Saturday, and the Muslims would use them on Friday. That's what the first mosques were built for. And so uh, coming into Jerusalem, they were viewed as liberators. And um, until the crusade started, there seemed to be a pretty solid balance of power uh, between the Christians, Jews, and Muslims that were in Jerusalem. 
they seemed to get along really pretty well. And um, it was only at the, the start of the, the Crusades, uh, right around that time period where uh, things began to go horribly wrong. And you, know, you see this over and over again throughout the world. Like for example, Central Africa, you get North Africa is primarily principally Muslim, South Africa, Southern Africa is principally Christian, where the two start coming together um, that is used as an excuse for a lot of conflict. But outside of the immediate conflict zones, you get Muslim and Christian families living together just fine. Um, a friend of mine, uh, he and his best friend on a gas station in Puyallup, Washington, they fled there um, after one of the uh, wars between in um, Israel against um, uh, Palestine. And uh, the, these two guys are best friends. Their families have been best friends for over 800 years. One family is Muslim and the other family is Christian. And they've always been best friends. And it's just, it's, it's fascinating to me how these divides in religion seem to show up when it's politically expedient. And then when we, you look at um, uh, Constantine, when he went to uh, Byzantium, what did he do? about those religious divides. Do you guys remember? He supported, he wholeheartedly supported cross-pollination. And you see the same thing uh, later, uh, a thousand years later in India, where the Muslims come into uh, as rule, rulers in um, Hindu areas. Uh, you, you see the same kind of thing. When it's politically, Expedient people realize that the religions get along really well, and when it's politically expedient otherwise, then they find reasons to highlight the different the differences. Um, I just it, it's really fascinating to me how that goes, how that happens. But definitely watch all those videos; very cool stuff. And now we're gonna. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Vikings. This is these are a group of people that we have not talked about quite a bit. Sadly, in every culture, um, there are, you know, over a thousand years, there's going to be groups of people that are utter, utter, utter buttheads. And um, they will have a tendency, and I, I think, I don't know if any of you guys are psychologists, I think that it, the tendency comes from wanting to deny a, a guilty conscience it seems like when bad people take over, they try to destroy uh, the history of the people that they are taking over so that the, the new world view becomes more compatible with uh, their new narrative. Um, you know, the history becomes more compatible with their new uh, worldview and narrative. And it's, and that, that happens quite a bit. And it's, it's just interesting to me that we see that over and over again. The reason why I, I bring that up is for a long time, Vikings were looked down on as real ignorant scoundrels. Um, and part of their version of a pagan religion uh, was um, a, a sacrament that involved uh, violence. And, it, you know, that was uh, the Christian sacrament is not an awful lot different other than um, in activity level because uh, Christians through their sacrament or Eucharist are still uh, consuming blood. It just happens to be that the, the blood was uh, shed peaceably and symbolically with water or wine. And uh, in a lot of um, Norse paganism or Asa through uh, the, the um, sacrament for a particular group of deities did involve the violent blood, uh, shedding of blood. But that was only for uh, um, a few of the deities. But I can imagine if, if you are a monk that lived in one of these areas that were unfortunate enough for a raiding party to come to, you would see things very, very differently. But the reason I, I say all that is after a, um, a number of generations, 
as Vikings were extending their influence, they began to be more and more heavily influenced by um, Christian ideas and Christian symbolism. They began realizing, just as Constantine did, that compatibility was a better way to make long-term income than uh, violence. And what is really interesting is that by the by the ninth century, Vikings, because everybody knew that the, you know their their martial system was one of the most effective. Uh, they were employed as uh, bodyguards and support systems by a lot of different cultures. And um, the Abbasids, and we're, we're talking, you know, we're getting close, they were, this is in Turkey now, the Abbasids started employing them as bodyguards. And uh, what is really fascinating to me is that a lot of what we know now about honest Viking history, what really happened is actually history that was recorded by uh, the Arabic speaking uh, employers and associates of the Vikings. You know, so a lot of Muslims recorded uh, their, their history. Um, you've seen, I don't know, have any of you guys seen uh, 13th Warrior? It, it, it is a really solidly researched movie, very well done. And uh, it takes place around 8th, 9th century, about this time. And uh, Antonio Banderas, best Zorro ever. I'm sorry if anybody disagrees with that. You're, you'll be sad to know that you're wrong. But Antonio Banderas plays a Muslim ambassador who is uh, tasked with being the 13th warrior on uh, a mission of mercy with Vikings. And uh, a lot of the material in that that is historically accurate came because of people in real life that uh, were like Antonio Banderas's character who uh, wrote the stuff down. So we know about the, the, the burials, uh, the, the widow of a chieftain, how she would die, uh, the political structure, the political the maneuverings that would happen so that violence was used as surgical strike as opposed to you know, ex explosive and, um, uh, devastation. And, and uh, I think it's the British SAS even uh, uh, claims in their uh, genesis and lineage uh, uh, Norman Viking uh, martial arts, <laughs> which I, I think is kind of cool. I don't know if that's true or that not, but it, it's neat nonetheless. And then this, this talks about the Viking Age. It's about 10 minutes. I don't think we need to, to look at that. But I do want to have you look at this. This is the Oseberg ship. A lot of the Viking art, what is problematic to me, but good for them, is that the Vikings knew how to make stuff that lasted. I mean, they knew how to make stuff that would last a long time. Uh, just as Persians uh, were excellent for carpentry, uh, carpet making, uh, Vi and Egyptians and Turks were really good for ceramics and the Chinese. Uh, the, the Vikings were really good for uh, jewelry and uh, boat making. They also had some really fascinating technology that I think we get into in some of those videos too. But uh, why that's problematic is that if you have a, a, say for example, a bit of jewelry that's Viking that comes from the 8th century and it has a shelf life of 1,200 years, we really don't know the history of that item and who made it other than the fact of you know, what the family has been telling as it's been passed down and changed hands over the years. And uh, that, that's why I think it's a little bit problematic because it's really hard to date a lot of this stuff unless you have a find like the Elsenberg ship that is found in the dirt undisturbed. So let's go ahead and watch this. And um, I, I think that, that this will pretty well close out our, um, our meeting today. Now we get to the Scandinavian and wrong slide. Now we get to the Scandinavian invasion, the Vikings. Now the Vikings were people from 
the Scandinavian countries, primarily from Norway, Sweden, a little bit in Finland, a little bit in Denmark. And the reason they're going to go out raiding is not so much to raid. That's what we tend to associate with them. But in fact, a lot of their missions are trade missions because their homelands are lousy agricultural areas. So they almost entirely rely on trade. Uh, also, when you hear about the Normans, they are effectively Viking rather than being French. That's a little bit of a different story. So Viking is actually a verb. Uh, it's something that these people do. They would have seen themselves as Scandinavians. And they would raid and pillage basically every time they just couldn't get a good trade mission going, they would uh, raid and pillage if they had no other uh, form of sustenance. You don't want to go out raiding and pillaging or relying on it all the time because it is a very high-risk endeavor. And they're going to travel throughout Europe. We're going to see them come down as far as Constantinople. There are actually writings in Islam that tell us about Viking burials. That's where we find out about them. And we're finding out that from the Black Sea. So they're covering a considerable area. Of course, we have uh, Eric the Red who discovers Greenland. We have Leif Erikson in North America. We have the discovery of Iceland. Uh, they will travel all the way to Italy and elsewhere. And they aren't necessarily raiding all the time. As I said, a lot of these are trade missions, and then they, tra they raid when necessary. This pillaging would allow their society to continue. And their ships are what does it for them. These ships are remarkable vessels, uh, great seagoing vessels with these large rectangular sails. And... Just having a ship isn't good enough. Of course, we're in the north where you don't have the sun for navigation for a considerable time of the year. So they have one other trick up their sleeve. They have something called the Viking sunstone. It's actually calcite. And what it does is it actually polarizes the light so they can find the sun, find where the sun is in the sky and continue to navigate even in rough weather as long as it's daylight and at night they need to rely on being able to see the stars this ability to navigate long distances sets them apart and the vikings will eventually disappear because all of those areas that they traded with and raided and pillaged they would go there because they had resources. So the Vikings would integrate themselves into those societies. Uh, a great deal of the English population will be uh, of, of Viking heritage, as well as most of Northern France, parts of Italy, Southern Italy, uh, specifically areas around the Black Sea, etc. So they really don't suddenly disappear. They simply don't come back home. And it makes a lot of sense because why come home to a rocky, cold environment when there's good agricultural land to be had elsewhere? Or they move to Minnesota. So let's talk about the Usberg ship. This is discovered near Oslo in 1904. And this is a Viking vessel carved out of oak. And in this case, it was likely ceremonial rather than being used for raiding. In fact, we believe that it's for a burial. Uh, and here we see another version of the Usberg ship or another uh, image of it. The bow and stern are elaborately carved with interlaced forms and wild beasts. And we also see grave goods. Uh, here it is at when it was buried uh, as they're excavating it. The interesting thing is we find people and animals, which is not that remarkable in Viking society. Oftentimes, they would poison people close to the person being buried, and they would be buried with this person. But we have one woman on the ship who's a good deal older than anyone else, and this likely indicates the burial of a queen or priestess, indicating a great equality in Viking society with women. So it's sometimes interesting which societies give women a fair element of equality and which do not. 
Now, from the ship, we have the animal head post. And this is wood carving mixed with metalwork. It's basically the spirit of the ship. And the importance here is that you tend to see a lot of superstition amongst sailors. The reason being the weather on the seas can change for no apparent reason. You have rogue waves and other natural phenomena that are terrifying and completely unpredictable. So oftentimes they will attribute a spirit to the ship or they're attributing elements of a god to the ship to find favor. But it all kind of boils back to superstition. And this post is not a massive thing. It wasn't meant to terrify people. It's actually quite small. It's measured in inches. When we look at it, you'll notice the Celtic network, especially on the sides, stands out and that indicates to us that there's not only cult, uh, material trade and looting and plundering in Ireland, but we also see cultural trade, cultural hybridization between the Vikings and the Celts, uh, which is very important to keep in mind. Those Celtic ideas will spread around Europe. Uh, it will die out over time. Uh, much like Viking society, but they will spread uh, at various times through Europe. Now, the Vikings also, as I said, are famous for raiding the Irish mob. I'm sorry, we, we're going over a bit. Is is it okay if we watch the rest of this and then wind up? Is that going to be okay? Yeah, I think it'll be fine. Just 30 more seconds. Okay. Monasteries, which would give, uh, bring a downfall to that Irish literary tradition, uh, that tradition of the monks sitting alone, copying books and saving them for Western civilization. But by the time the Vikings show up to do that, the Irish have already passed a lot of those books into Europe ahead of the Vikings. And so not all of them will be destroyed. Others are moved for safekeeping. Which means we need to move to Europe. All right, excellent. So I, I'd like you guys to uh, look at the rest of the stuff in that module. Um, it, this was a brief introduction to some of the um, Viking work. That interlacing that we see it parallels the evolution of the interlacing geometry and, and uh, vegetal work that we see in Islamic art, but I do not think that one of them necessarily directly inspired the other. It seems to me more that they are uh, culturally parallel because they, they both represent a, a network of connection in the natural world. And uh, I, I, it is fascinating to see uh, the parallels and that's what I think they are. I think they are parallels. All right, any questions before we break for next week? All right, folks, if you have any questions, please let me know. And again, if I'm not responding to the email speedily, uh, text me. And you'll find my phone number at the first page of um, the course on Canvas. I'm liking what I'm seeing from you guys. I look forward to seeing you all next week. And I hope and I'm glad to see that uh, none of you were arrested over fall breaks. It's always good. I had my worries about Caleb, but everybody else, I was confident you guys would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll see you guys next week.